Good afternoon and welcome to Lunchtime Marketing and Leadership Series with Kevin and Craig, where we add value to people's lives happening every Thursday on ebizradio.com. You can catch the Lunchtime Series on all major podcast channels and joining me as per usual, marketing and communications expert and co-host, Craig Page Lee Hayden. Kevin, yeah, great to be chatting and... Yeah, I'm, traveling I'm, the world. <laughs> <laughs> I wish it was the world. Yeah, but no. Yeah, sitting sitting in London doing recording from London today. Well, I'll I'll be here next week and we do next week session as well. But really, just you know, great to be out and about. Um, but yeah, I just want to say that that I absolutely enjoyed our conversation the past two weeks when we we're covering the topic yeah. of bias and yeah you know, and and in this this travel journey, I've been quite cognizant of assessing my actions and reactions in 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 ways that that really help change the potential outcome of the situation with understanding how to move away from some of the negative uh, biases that, that we actually picked up on. So yeah, really great to to be aware more more acutely aware of, of, of these things. And that, that's what's so, so interesting about your bias. You know, the fact that is, as humans, we will always have bias. It's just a, it's a fact. It's just our brain's way of sh- making those shortcuts. Uh, what we can do is we can be aware of our biases. And, you know, to that point, it's like having the cognizance about what is my brain doing and how am I doing it, you know. And that's Correct. the that's where the changes really happen because your bias won't ever, there's no switch to kind of switch them off. They're there. They're built in for a reason, right? Um, but the awareness can absolutely be there. So I'm, I'm glad that that's yeah, what you're picking up from it. Yeah, yeah. And and particularly watching people around me, you know, because you know, I'm sitting here in an international environment where London is, is for me, you know, this beautiful melting pot of cross culture, cross everything that you come across. And just watching the behaviors and actions and and emotions of everything and everyone around me you can definitely see which of some of those biases come to play in the daily routine so um so i mean craig before we we uh before we get into the show today i'm dying to hear about uh, your time in london and where where i believe you will be for the next two weeks um are there a few standing uh, things trends and happenings that you have noted and worth sharing yeah, Kevin, um, there's there's a hell of a lot happening in the city and, and it's got a broader impact on Europe and impacted on by Europe. Um, I think one of the things that, that is, is, is quite prevalent is the conversation around the hybrid work model. Very, very, very prevalent um, yeah. in, in, in the various organizations that I've been chatting to folks that, that, that I know there. It's a topic that is not going away, and and these businesses are definitely going to be re-gearing with that in mind moving forward, and they're considering the repurposing of their space and things to to accommodate that. So that's number one. And the second one is just the 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 plethora of hybrid and e-fueled cars in the city. Really, yeah, yeah. It's we're we're a long way behind in South Africa in respect of of those propositions, but really, it's 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 absolutely key. There's big taxes for cars coming into the city, um, so fuel emissions is 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 really one of the the top of the agenda conversations. And then the economy, um, you know, the whole of Europe is 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 feeling the bite in the back of the wall. So recessionary conversation, but definitely everybody's sort of buying down at the moment as well. Yeah, I mean, when we were in Amsterdam, that's one of the things I noted was there was more bicycles than cars uh, in the city, um, and it made for it makes so much sense because everybody's sort of in the city, living in the city, but they also, um, if they're not living in the city, they'll just cycle to work, um, and you know, it, it it makes for a better a better in uh, sort of. Um, uh, conversation around climate change around how people are using uh vehicles how, how much fuel spend there is in the in the city um and yes, all of that you yes. know it's adding that um to 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 the the betterment of that city in itself so but it is it's interesting to see when you see it uh, you know uh, and the amount of teslas i must tell you the amount of teslas i've seen <laughs> i'm like i've never seen so many teslas in a country and germany has uh, has quite a few teslas just driving around it's just it's, it's amazing so, so on that point, every single street corner is another Tesla. Yeah, it's yeah. just it's it's phenomenal. It really is. 
It's good yeah, to I, see, actually. I, I, I really absolutely. appreciate it. It's definitely the future. But Craig, um, yeah, getting back to the show, um, what are some of the reminding points that you can, from last week's conversation that you can share with us um, around how we used uh, and, and use correctly bias uh, that drives sales and product take up? Kevin, yeah, thanks. Um, I want to go back and reference the article that, that we covered last week titled Six Cognitive Biases um, You Can Exploit to Boost Sales. It was published by Robert Manning on the 25th of November, 2021. And uh, the key points come, come from that article. So the six cognitive biases that can be used in a marketing strategy to, to boost sales are noted as follows. So the first being the mere exposure effect, bias number one. So that this bias describes our tendency to develop preference for things simply because we're familiar with them. And the way to use the mere exposure effect to boost sales is to leverage retargeting to boost sales as a click-through rate of, of a retargeted ad is 10 times higher than a display ad. The, the second bias there is loss aversion. And here people prefer not to lose something they already have than to acquire something of equal value. Um, the, the, the way to use the loss aversion to boost sales is to offer free trials and samples of your product because people are more likely to form an attachment with the product on, on, on the back of trial. The third bias is, is the compromise effect. And here's the tendency to avoid extremes and choose that intermediate uh, choice. And, and the way to use the compromise effect to, to boost sales is to actually place the main option in the middle of a range of price points so people will actually focus on it more than the two extreme options. The fourth bias here is, is the framing effect. And this is where people decide on options based on whether the options are represented with a positive or negative connotation. And how to use the framing effect to boost sales is to, to frame your offer in such a way that it is clear that not taking up the proposition is actually losing out. The fifth bias here, one of my favorite here, is, is the IKEA effect, where consumers place a dispor disproportionately high value of products that par partially participate in creating. And this is a direct reference to IKEA, the Swedish manufacturing furniture retailer, which actually sells items of furniture that you self-assemble. And, and the way to use the IKEA effect to boost sales is to actually involve consumers in, in product development or give and allow them to give input in the process of the design and makeup of, of, of the product as well. And finally, uh, bias six here is, is the Pelsman effect or risk compensation theory. And this is where people are more likely to engage in risky behavior when security measures have been mandated. For instance, the lack of use of seatbelts, where now that they have seatbelts, they're actually going to drive the car faster and much more recklessly. Um, and the way to use the Peltzman effect to do sales is to actually outline clear no risk on you refund policies, which will shift the risk from the consumer to the brand if they do make a, a purchase in that regard. The important thing to understand, Kevin, is that while these biases can be applied to, to a marketing strategy to help boost sales, marketers should not overuse these biases when rolling out their marketing strategy. Absolutely, yeah. One of my favorite topics, and I'm so glad that we could cover it. So, thank you for 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 um, for 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 doing all of this work and 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 finding a good conversation about it, Craig. I absolutely loved it. You mentioned last week that we we were going to have a guest speaker on the show today, and that uh, we were going to ta tackle the topic of fossil fuels and the and the creative industry. I yes. know for a fact that you have secured our special guest for next week, uh, and as such, what are we going to discuss today? Yeah, Kevin, thanks. Um, it's, it's great that we got this conversation confirmed for next week and, and some two, two guests coming onto the show on the conversation, really important. But as a replacement topic, I've decided that we should look at another important conversation, which I believe we'll be able to actually establish a series around going forward. And that is the importance of call centers, the importance, I should say, of call centers in the marketing mix. And, and, Definitely good recurring conversation because not only will we look at it from the purpose of what a call center is to how it adds value to the marketing mix, but actually to to get to understand the the management required in the delivery of a great call center uh, uh, proposition in in the world there. So yeah, so picking picking up on that special topic today, but but looking forward to a good range of of conversations around it. 
Yeah, and I, I and I'm, it's going to be interesting to see how we tie that in, Craig, because also, you know, one of the things we've reiterated over so many shows already is, uh, you know, putting your client first, uh, creating a relationship. Um, and your call center is your, your, your voice of your, of your brand, right? Uh, they, they the first contact that people have with your brand. And that's uh, correct. They play a huge, important part to, you know, how people perceive a brand. Um, and I mean, just through some, some call, call centers I am aware of and I know and I've experienced, uh, <laughs> I have a, a strong opinion yeah. on, on some of them. <laughs> but yes. The 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 <laughs> yeah we can we can spend an entire show just talking about the experience that some of us have had in the call centers. <laughs> but yeah, um, the the way to do it is let's just set the context and and dive into becoming familiar with the concept behind it. So yeah, we we all probably have incredibly negative stories to share, Kevin. That's that's a fact. But yeah, at at the end of the day, uh, we shouldn't necessarily have to tar all with the same brush in, in this particular instance because there's a multitude of call centers and they all actually have very different purposes in the brand journey, which theoretically means different experiences to be delivered in each instance. Um, so yeah, let's let's set the context about just kicking off with our you know, good old default uh, Wikipedia definition. So here it defines a call center as a managed capability that can be centralized or remote that is used for receiving or transmitting a large volume of inquiries by telephone. An inbound call center is operated by a company to administer incoming product or service support information inquiries from consumers. So already you can see the linkage to the marketing space there. Another a good reference is, is from callcenterhelper.com where we note that the call center is a department or an office in which deals with incoming and outgoing telephone calls. These can be both from new and existing customers and are handled by a team of advisors, otherwise known as agents. And for many companies, this is the cornerstone of, of customer service. And it's a tradition for companies of larger sizes to have call centers for the purpose of four different functions. Firstly, offering customer support. Secondly, handling their queries. Thirdly, carrying out telemarketing. That's where a lot of us get our negative experience. And, and, and engagement from, and then and then finally conducting market research. But this definition does overstate that, again, each of these functions has evolved over the past few years, which has led to the emergence of a term where it's now the contact center as opposed to the call center, because it is very much a, 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 a two-way dialogue now, and it's about those contacts in the consumer journey, and the call center is there to be one of the contact reference points. I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned contact center as, as as this is a term that's supposedly different in function and performance to a call center. Is that correct? Even a, a good question and one where the answer isn't necessarily straightforward because yes, it, it as, as humans do, we all like to complicate things. A um, little bit of help from, from callcenterhelper.com, which helps us unpack that a little bit. So a call center differs from a contact center in that it's traditionally only dealing with voice calls. So as soon as the call center handles queries from any other channels of contact that we're aware of, for instance, email, live chat, messaging, bots and things like that, it becomes the contact center. And that's generally where it goes from a single directional engagement to a conversational multi-directional engagement. So while it's technically still the case in most of the you know, organizations that I handle customer queries over emails as well as the phone, the industry is still stuck with the label. And as such, the, the term call center and contact center are fairly interchangeable in use. Uh, but finally, the article informs us that, that some organizations also use the term customer experience hub or customer care or global support. In essence, they're just, you know, skinning these these concepts with, with some some beautiful words uh, uh, to overlap. Yeah, and I think when you do, when you are skimming them over with some beautiful words, you need to live up to your standard. You need need to live up to some kind of, you know, like uh, like the um, being part of what it is you're labeling it as. Because if you don't, you know, if you're not caring for your customers or you're not actually supporting and uh, having a wonderful experience, uh, it speaks yeah, directly to the brand. Uh, you know, I would call out Facebook and in, in Instagram for this because there is nowhere that you can get hold of anyone from Facebook or Instagram. I don't know if you know this. 
Um, uh, my Instagram account has been hacked recently, and oh, there wow. is absolutely no way that I can get them to actually help me fix it. Uh, it's, 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 it, it's so, you know, part of this speaks again to there might be negative connotations to what a call center might have for a brand, but to a large degree, the, you know, a brand, people's connection to a brand is far greater when I feel like I can, I can actually get hold of a human and say, listen, please help me fix yeah, the I'm situation. I, I, I totally understand that. You know, we were trying to do, in fact, we were part of a, a, a media proposition in which Facebook was one of the, the core components of it. We we had such a bad experience that we actually went to Facebook's office in Johannesburg to try and talk to somebody to get through to the point that we needed assistance. In. And, and, you know, they just push you away. So, no, you've got to use the digital channels. And, uh, yeah, not, not necessarily a, a successful intervention anyway. Yeah, I mean, I, and I've worked in a number of call centers and, you know, from uh, ranging from F&B to uh, bank serve to multi-choice. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of uh, engagement and there's a lot of stuff that they need to learn. Interestingly enough, um, way back when I started my business, uh, one of the things that I noticed uh, in, in the call center industry was that people didn't know how to develop confidence. Um, and we were doing a sales training, sort of sales training for an environment. Um, and we worked, we worked predominantly on confidence in that, in that section. Um, and hand, we had profound sort of turnaround and profound kind of um, uh, results because of it. And uh, it's, it's interesting to, to, to kind of when you go into an environment like that, uh, you think it's about one thing and it totally changes because it, the, the, the call center industry, I think, is quite a dynamic space. Yes. And yes. there's a quite, a lot, quite a lot of things happening in, in the space as well. And uh, there, there will definitely be points to bring up in, in the ongoing conversation around the topic, Kevin. There's no doubt about that. So, so we know that there's a number of uh, terms and phrases defi defining the industry. But with all that said, is, is, is there still such a thing as traditional call center or contact center? Yeah, I was, yeah, yeah, good question. I'm, and I'm, I'm assuming that you're referring to, to the people-based model versus technology-driven model because, you know, yeah. for us at this point, yeah, traditional call center, we all default to the thinking that it's a people-driven model. Um, exactly, yes, yes. Yeah, yes. yeah. But with that in mind, Kevin, I'd like to reference the report that I came across published by Deloitte, which was uh, developed for, for Customer Service Leaders Forum. And the article is titled Delivering the Digital Contact Center. Digital channels open new opportunities for contact centers. And the report opens with the following statement. With digital channels, uptake steadily increases and a new and increasing valuable role is emerging for a contact center. We are becoming more comfortable self-serving for things ranging from paying our council tax to checking when our order is going to arrive. And, and this is the digital penetration that we talk about. And as this increases, the trend is more likely to continue. But where does this leave that traditional people-based uh, service channel that that we that we reference? Well, it's far from forcing the contact center to its deathbed. The digital channels are actually giving these contact centers a new lease of life, Kevin. And as as transactional inquiries move to self-service channels, the the contact center advisors are actually being freed up to provide more valuable service to customers. And I think. That plays to the whole conversation we've had around AI as well. There's this big misnomer that, you know, the, the emergence of AI in, in the world of, of branding, marketing and sales is just going to destroy jobs and the likes. But actually what it is going to do is it's going to automate the, the highly repetitive processes and it's going to allow staff to gain new skills and became, become more effective in the conversation and relationship touch point with consumers. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I completely I see the space that AI is useful. Um, I'm still on that, you know, as a, as a person, as, as someone who, who wants to use a certain brand and as a customer, I, I still want to have that human engagement. I still want to, you know, get to speaking to someone at the end of the day. And until, until AI can literally replace the human, and I don't know if they're ever going to get there um, to that degree, that um, you know, it's 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 conversational. Um, so I think that's going to still be uh, you know take a long time for them to have that full transition from 
from going from human to just AI. Um, yeah, and, and the, you, Kevin, it's so important. The the reality is AI is always going to be balanced with the human intervention because yeah, you know, as much as the algorithms are learning to answer the standardized questions and frequently you know, FAQs, yeah, you know, it'll just spew those out. There, there's always that one that's out of sync or that one that needs some emotional uh, uh, cognitive realization to move it to the next point. So, yeah, I think we're a long way from AI getting anywhere near that. But but what's what's great is the article focuses on four key areas, Kevin, where, where contact centers should evolve in the digital age. And, and it introduces the, the subheading, a place for traditional contact centers. And this section actually positions the reality of the value of digital channels. So it opens as follows. Compared to automated digital channels, contact centers are expensive to run, very important point, often deliver less consistent customer experience, highly important for, for the longevity of customer relationships, and, and sometimes generates negative customer sentiment. You can go through six, seven, eight levels of IVR to, to try and get to a point where all you want to do is just talk to a human being. Um, so yeah, on, on, on the back of that, we really need to understand what the future of, of contact centers is. And, and the four key areas that the article focuses on to, to understand this digital emergence is firstly around really getting to understand the digital experience in the delivery, owning the customer across that entire omni-channel experience, which we talk about often, employing a new breed of contact center advisor, definitely one of the key conversations for one of our future uh, uh, shows, and then exploiting the omni-channel information. So yeah, those, those are really four key themes. And definitely when we look at them in isolation, they can form very, very strong uh, ongoing conversation pieces. Yeah, you know, Craig, I, I think and the, the, <laughs> the digital experience, and I'm going to name it, you know, F&B, F&B was one of the first that said, please da put your, your ID number into the call so we can make sure that we know who you are and all that jazz. And every time you do that, you sit in that phone call for 25 minutes, and then the person that you actually reach does exactly the same process, and they have to do all the security checking, and, and you're kind of going, like what are you just why are you just wasting people's time it's like it's yeah. and i think that digital experience and delivering it and and delivering it well that first engagement if that is not if that is not flawless in the you know in the call center environment um it's it really it has a huge negative impact on on it's, the brain it's itself. it's one of my pet peeves exactly yeah. that you know all you want to do is talk to a human being but you've got to go through all of these verification points and then they ask you to do the same thing. And I often ask the consultant at the other side, you know, you carrying the brand, I've just been through six, seven layers to get to you. And now you, you know, you're going through exactly the same thing I've done in, in the physical sense. It's just, it's, it's irritating. It really is. Nevertheless, the, 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 let's look at those four, four key areas in detail, Kevin. And there's three points that actually describe delivering the digital experience in, in detail here. And the first one is managing failure demand. And this looks at the most basic level and, 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 and helps us understand that there'll always be a role for contact centers to pick up the pieces when the digital experience doesn't deliver what the customer needs, default back to the human. So whether that's due to immature self-service uh, self channels where, where the technology hasn't been developed sufficiently enough, or on the other end, really complex customer requirement where the likes of AI actually hasn't got to understand uh, incident resolution in that instance. And, and you know, that that is where human intervention is, is really important. So many of the contact centers are ever finding themselves at adopting to this failure demand role as the digital channels become more popular. The second point under, under this area of focus is targeted digital adoption. And here, migration of the right contact center demand to digital self-service channels is essential in delivering the digital strategy and remaining competitive for, for a brand. And the contact center advisors are central to promoting these digital channels to contact center customers. And again, this is really an important point for a future conversation because these contact center advisors really need to understand the value of that channel in 
driving further sales in the in the marketing mix. And the third point under under this area of focus is delivering the digital customer service. So the customer service agents are at the heart of that digital experience and they interact with customers over these new channels such as web chat, video, and social media. And they actually need to be adept at understanding these channels as well, Kevin, to be able to give the right uh, uh, engagement and experience through those channels. Moving on to the to the second theme, and that is the the owning the customer across the omnichannel experience. The point you know, there's three points here as well, and that is at the heart of the cross-channel customer experience, with access to data from all of the touch points, the customer experience uh, um, advisors often is, you know, can be assessed across the various channels, and they are able to then issue the right opportunity on the basis of using that information correctly. And, and the critical thing here, again, is they need to be well-versed in understanding the performance of those various touch points across, across the journey, Kevin. Moving the contact center to customer engagement centers is, is a proactive customer intervention opportunity. And as customers move between these channels, there's always the risk that a customer is going to be dropped. It, it happens to us on a daily basis. Here, the contact centers really are, are well positioned to look across the entire journey and intervene where they can uh, add value. And, you know, the more sophisticated technology layers in the, in the contact centers are able to very quickly pick up where, where that failure is, whether it was through the SM chat bot, uh, uh, SMS chat bot, or, or something in the, the email, they're able to intervene and, and pick up the conversation again. The sixth point here is that a shared source of knowledge and feedback is, is, is critical. So central to creating the omnichannel experience the availability of consistent information is key across all channels. And the contact center acts as that focal point to actually identify and resolve the knowledge related customer issues and support new content creation for, for self-improved service. And that's a great point because this is an iterative process. And as you know, content is vital in, in the conversation with brands and, and the more they're able to complete the self-fulfillment process and bring new content in to help move others down the journey is is key yeah the third the third area of focus is is exploiting the omni-channel information data obviously key here kevin so this point is about analyzing customer data to drive the wider business objective and here the contact center's central role is actually managing that customer experience which means that it's able to use the rich sources of data that it collects to to combine them with data from other channels to give insights to customers' needs and behaviors. One example could be, you know, making the sale in retail where the contact center advisor has the right product knowledge and is supported by rich information on the back end, all about the customer's online browsing behavior, in-store purchases, et cetera, understanding the previous engagements with the brand and, and then being in a stronger position to recognize the opportunity to drive that sale to conclusion through through that kind of intervention. And then the final area of focus, Kevin, is, is leveraging the new breed of contact center advisor. As I mentioned earlier, this is really a great conversation piece for, for one of our next topics, uh, at least for next shows on the topic. And here there's, the, there's three areas of focus. One is a different kind of contact center advisor is, is, is coming to the fore. Here the, the contact center advisor role will shift from process to knowledge orientation and the new advisor skill set is required with a much wider communication skill and deeper understanding of the company's product services and customer needs and this this moves it away from that generic role of just standard scripted one directional com uh, uh, you know projection of conversation as opposed to really understanding the essence of the product and where that need point would be and be able to draw the consumers into that the, the second point under this theme is with access to the right tools and data, the context of centers will shift to a knowledge and advisory focus with the right technology, however, must be employed to enable those advisors to actually make customer decisions given based upon the best available information at that time. And then the final point around these is, is managed in a different way to enable different outcomes. And here, the increased adoption of the digital channels actually changes the principles of demand and the strategic delivery of that contact center 
looking at resourcing models, performance management processes, they all need to adapt accordingly, Kevin. And and that that requires a lot of training and skills development and improvement. Yeah. Craig, you know, as you as you're talking, what, what stands out a lot for me is is you know, a call center um, can really provide the your, the business uh, uh, with a lot of data, right? Um, yes. And you know, as mentioned now, you know, if you if you torture that data enough to to really sort of find trends that you're noticing, um, you could really, I mean, because uh, I'm thinking, you know, specifically our, like the banks, they, they they have large groups of or number l- large numbers that are that that, that are part of the brand. Um, you know, and enough with enough uh, torturing of the data and sort of analyzing it, you could really, really come up with some amazing, amazing solutions. Um, I'm surprised that you know that that we that we haven't you know further more than we than we than we do currently with our banking system come up with with a lot more solutions for lower income earning uh, you know people in the country um, because I think you know, there's enough data to support you know how what the trends show or you know what's possible um, and you could also use the call center for that you know you could use the data from the call center and that 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 connection and and contact um, to see you know what's working and what's not and I I, I you know just listening to all of this, I don't think it's done as well as it could could be done, I'm, really. I, I, I'm smiling for a couple of reasons. Firstly, I love your, your phrase, torture the data. Um, you know, there, there, there definitely is a lot of truth in that. When, when one clearly gets to understand the laser depth of the data behind it, more effective solutioning can come out of that. But, but solutioning often isn't the focus. They're using it just to drive another sale, Kevin. And and that's yeah. why there's this importance to move away from that pure outbound projected call center kind of mentality into this collective contact center where it's about not just pushing a sale, but nurturing relationships, understanding where the where the you know the soft spots are, where the challenging areas are, and actually working through those. And I think what's happening in particularly in the financial services area, is they're using the data to get to understand typical pattern recognition, and then they're finding the customers that possibly match into that spectrum, and then they're trying to push a sale into that, that arena. And that's, yeah, that's just the sheer nature of a sales center. But, but at the end of the day, they're not using it to create solutioning to find new product opportunities that come out of that. And, and that's the thing, and that's where the differentiator. So, banks, if you're listening, this is the, the that's where the differentiator sits. If 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 banks actually take this data and and start focusing on retention and keeping their clients and keeping the the existing clients happier, um, more people would want to, you know, I would want to be part of a bank that that checks in with me and says, you know, is there anything that we can help you with? Is there anything that we could do for you? Um, and start using that as a trend or as a, as a mechanism rather uh, to collect data to kind of see what are the what are the core kind of problems that you know South Africans are experiencing right now and I don't think they do that I think they make enough money to not care to have to do it and I think that's where the with where, where an actual differentiator or an industry uh, like you you could be an industry an industry disruptor based on the fact that you're actually you're actually going out to find, you know, how to solutionize and come up with a solution for your audience because you're actively wanting to to help solve problems. Yeah, and and you know, just to add another layer to that, Kevin, there are instances where call centers, contact centers are actually delivering some outbound research engagement conversations, but the negative perception and the negative experiences that we've had in general with those call centers is that you just push them away. So you actually really don't get into that two-way conversation to start building a a deeper relationship with a brand around questions asked and how you can improve performance, et cetera, et cetera. The minute a call center comes up, you know, I've got the true call identifier, just push that away, push it away. I'm not interested because every other engagement has just been such a negative engagement. And I think, and, and I think that's because it's a, 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 an aim at selling something and not solving 100%. something. Correct. And that's, that's selling, the not thing. solving. Yeah, that's that's yeah. a nice phrase. Selling, not solving. Because because coming out of understanding solving, 
you lead to solutioning. And yeah, that's really and, then, where we need to and that's where people want to buy, right? They want to buy Correct. because you, you're solving my problem. So yes, I'm going to buy from you. So, but they 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 pushing on the sales. Uh, and we we'll get more make of sense. the get more of the the IP effect buys coming to to fruition there. Then <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah. as we near to the, at the end of the show, what are the key takeaway points that we can share with our listeners, Craig? Yeah, Kevin, so, so for the takeaway points today, I want to reference again that, that callcenterhelper.com blog post. Um, the, the article was titled, What is a Call Center? 10 Things You Need to Know. And, and it shares the following key insights for us. So number one, people account for around 70% of a call center's cost, very, very high cost. So people working in call centers have real impact on the customer, even more so than the technology or process, but, but really they need to be trained to ensure that that relevance remains in place. So investing in the right people with the right training will provide higher results, which is important. The second point here is people are challenging. <laughs> it's harder to manage a larger group of people working together. And as such, all call centers have a reputation for high turnover and absenteeism. And the, this, this challenge definitely makes managing the center especially difficult and considering that, that the contact centers you need managers to be able to forecast and plan their resources against the predicted call volumes. And when you're sitting there with big absenteeism, you've got big gaps in, in the service delivery chain as well. The third point is, 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 again, I think this doesn't apply just to call centers, but to business as a whole, that Monday is typically the busiest day of the week. Yeah, people are back after their, their weekends, you know, looking at their bills, deciding where to travel, et cetera, et cetera. And they're picking up the phone and calling the call centers, creating quite a big demand on, on the environment. The fourth point here is that customer calls are generally between 10 and 12 p.m., more so than any other time. And it's typically because, number one, those that are calling are either now at their desks and settled into, into the day and, and are starting to make personal calls, or secondly, that they've actually returned home after dropping kids at schools and doing the run around, and now they're getting on with their, their other important chores or, or tasks. The fifth point of, of these 10 is that technology does not always fully support the advisors in doing their job. And each technology component may be built separately from the others. So it's it's about bringing all the ingredients of those layers together to ensure that they actually work as a single unit. And um, you know, technology costs, so there's always those inhibiting factors as well, Kevin. The, the sixth point is that advisors are, are the voice and ears of the company, very important for brands to understand this, and that advisors will talk to more customers in a day than most people in the organization do in a year. And they can tell you what's happening with the customers, what's important to them, and what the competitors may be doing. Really important point to understand that. The seventh point here is that the call center managers do not have crystal balls, you know, which we all had. Um, the demand on managers to reach their service levels every day with all the constraints in place on them is probably what makes their role one of the most challenging and stressful jobs in, in the industry. Yeah. As such, many of those managers actually spend their time firefighting uh, situations and they actually don't have the time to, to raise their head above the, the parapet and work with their teams, train their teams, and find a, a common goal in, in building and establishing new opportunities for the teams into the future. The eighth point here is that leaders, team leaders drive business performance. They should be present with their teams in order to provide that support and advice and also being responsible for their coaching and developing their teams. But, you know, looking at the previous point, when they're really stuck in the trenches and, and, and they dealing with putting out fires and, and, and existing situations, they're never going to be in that position to be able to grow and develop their teams. And I think that that in itself is a, a good area for conversation for, for, for one of the shows. The ninth point here is the, the biggest critics of the call centers are often within the company itself. So have had bad experience with the call center, criticizing it, highlighting its failures, and this enables others to distract attention from their own performance. And the final point here is, is that call centers can be a great place to work. You'll have exposure to people management, vast amounts of technology, operational management, yeah, working through cultural issues, team dynamics, team working, politics and processes. So a really exciting dynamic place to work, but you need to ensure that the right leadership is there to take you through the journey of, of how to come through all of those points. Those are the key takeaways for today, Kevin. 
I love that absolutely, guy. And it's you know ten things to know about what what it is what a call center is, Craig. Um, because we're running out of time uh, on a very because we like talking so much. <laughs> um, and to conclude today's show, I'm really looking forward to our guest next week. So so that's exciting. Yeah, absolutely, Kevin. The topic of yeah fossil fuels and and why the agency will constantly to not take homicidals from this, which is of these institutions is really an important yeah and and such an important conversation to have and so so it's going to be exciting to speak to someone who you know works in that space and and has some insights on it so guys you yeah. can catch the lifestyle marketing leadership series with kevin and craig every thursday at 12 on ebusradio.com and uh, you can also check it out on uh, the lunchtime series YouTube channel uh, and also all uh, major podcast channels and we'll be here every every Thursday so please join us can check it out and uh, Craig thank you for the conversation it was fantastic and uh, interesting as always thank you Kevin look forward to next week <laughs>